Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all. Um, thank you, Walter, for getting this all set up this morning. I appreciate it. So um, last time we had talked about, let me go make sure I'm on the right page. Okay. <clears throat> we had talked about Theodore Herzl and what he witnessed when he was a journalist and it was the Dreyfus affair. And it was a, a huge case that shook the world. And it was Captain um, Alfred Dreyfus was basically a Jewish officer in the French army. Um, and they were shouting death to the Jews even back then and trying to get rid of him and running, running him out of the uh, military. And Herzl concluded that anti-Semitism anti uh, anti was stable and an immutable fact of human society, which assimilation didn't solve. He mulled over the idea of the Jewish sovereignty and despite ridicule of, of, of Jewish leaders, published uh, Der Jewstadt, which is the Jewish state in 1896. It's amazing because basically 40 years after this, well, 50 years after this, um, the nation of Israel would be in existence. Yes. Was an immutable characteristic. That, that means everybody was geared towards and designed with the idea of hating the Jews. Is, yep. is that what you're saying? Yeah. So is he, that what he's saying? He, he, came to, right. he came to this conclusion. That's why, that's why he said, we can't solve this by just fusing with the nations. We can't solve this by just... Um, becoming, um, what's the right word over, um, by, by assimilating, assimilating with the other cultures, we have got to pull ourselves apart from all of this and form our own nation. Because it's like, he experienced it in all over Europe, Russia, and um, France. So he was like, we're never going to get away from this. The only solution is for us to have our own country and to pull out. Um, and then, Basically, that was the philosophy he tried to imbue on others was, you know, um, help us become our own country and we'll get out of yours. <laughs> so uh, that, that attitude came around quite a bit. So Herzl argued that the ess essence of the Jewish problem was not an individual, but a national problem. So he um, declared that the Jews could only gain acceptance in the world only if they cease being a national anomaly. And you can see we're here in 2023. Has that solved the problem? <laughs> Not at all. Yes. I just, you know, while we're talking about today, I, I don't know if you saw it, but there were a bunch of Jewish students chased into a library um, and the, the students were yelling to them, why don't you hide in the attic? Oh my yeah. God. Where was this? Uh, was it Harvard? Or, no, I don't think it was Harvard. It was Oh, was that uh, of the, I thought the students were saying, why don't you hide in the attic? Of the diary of Anne Frank yeah. and, and others. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's like wide open in our country now. So why is it, why do we not tolerate any kind of racism, even microaggressions, but this nation and others, all, it's like open season for hating the Jews. I don't understand. Yes, Casey. Um, kind of a awkward question, but is Herzl's point saying, well, you know, we should just have our own country, we should go off on our own, uh, because we cannot assimilate, isn't that sort of a form of reverse racism? Yeah, um, it is. You know, the, uh, Hitler wanted, he, he started out wanting to send them all to Madagascar, but he couldn't right. make that happen. Um, and, and so isn't this just sort of the reverse of that? But then it, it is eventually, well, whether it's what God wanted or the way he saw that it would work out. For them return to their homeland. Yeah, it sounds like it's what he wanted <laughs> versus so, how it would work out. But it's, it's a, I don't know, but to me, it just sort of comes across as reverse racism. We need to be in our own place because we can't fit in with anybody else. I think that's a great point. And they've, they've never lost their identity as a people. So anthropologically, I want you to just think about this. 
what's happened to the Kickapoo Indians? What's happened to the Olmecs? What's happened to the Aztecs? What's happened to the Incas? Their religion, language, and people have almost disappeared. All that's left is the architecture. So when we think about the Jews coming back to their homeland and resurrecting a nation, a people, a religion, and a language, language is a big one we're gonna to get to, it's anthropologically impossible because of assimilation. Like you were saying, Casey, it's a reverse racism, what Herzl's proposing, yes. I raised my hand to answer the question, but you answered it, so. Oh, okay, <laughs> sorry. Did you have another comment about it? Well, I mean, in 10 generations, history shows everybody gets assimilated. Yeah. But that didn't happen with the Jews. It could happen in, in modern conditions. Now we are reestablishing the native tribes and giving them governments back and, and giving them ownership of the land back. Uh, at NASA Langley, we can't do anything without consulting a tribe somewhere up um, in Gloucester before we do anything for right. the ground. So. Huh, that's very interesting. Um, so this is very interesting because he's seeing this as the, as the solution for pulling this together. He says, the Jews are one people and their plight would be transformed into a positive force by the establishment of a Jewish state with the consequence of great powers. He saw the Jewish question as an international political question that we, we dealt with in the arena of international politics. So it's like if we just became our own nation and other nations recognize us, we'd solve the Jewish problem, we'd get the respect we deserve, we could prove ourselves because we'd be standing out of the country. So the other issue is, is what had happened to the, the Jews that were dispersed all over Europe and Russia and all over South, uh, sorry, North, North Africa, the New World? They rose to the top of every profession medicine, science, engineering, literature, music, manufacturing, whatever it is, they rose wherever they were sent in one to two generations, right to the top of Poland, Germany, Czechoslovakia, France, England, Spain, Italy. It didn't matter what country you sent them to, they rose to the top. So. This presents a two-way challenge. What did the native people of those countries think about them? Yeah. And so I was, I'm glad you said that. I was going to make the same point is socioeconomically, they generally have never struggled, you know, like you said. So people look around, they, one, they refuse to assimilate. Why don't they just become Americans? Why don't they just become Germans? No, they want to stay Jewish and take care of each other. Mm -hmm. And these things that you assume they're doing, that mm -hmm. they're, they're out to take care of one another despite everyone else, yet they're in our country, but look how successful they are. So there's, God has blessed them wherever they've gone because they're still his people, right? So, yep. it's, so it, it gives people this reason of, that human nature would say, you know what, I don't like these people. <laughs> they, they always seem to be winning, and they're our country and refuse to assimilate, and they only take care of each other. You know. Well, if you, to, to add to that, every crisis, when it reaches its its threshold, like the Spanish Inquisition, eighteen ninety, sorry, fourteen ninety two, in France when they kicked them out, and twelve ninety two when they kicked them out of England, it's always because there's a national crisis and they're succeeding. So it's time to seize all their assets and kick them out of the country. That's the same formula you see every time. Um, and it's repeated all the way through history. It's always jealousy and envy. It's the same thing in the land today. We got Casey and then Jessica. But isn't that also somewhat um, um, the, the, each country's fault because, and I don't know how pervasive this was, but I believe education was very highly uh, sought after because they weren't allowed to own land. Yeah, absolutely. So when it, wherever they went, you're absolutely right. They built hospitals, universities, churches, schools, community centers. I mean, here in Richmond, you've got many examples of that, but you don't have that for any other real culture. Go ahead. There's some irony in the fact that they were always commanded to be a separate people, and they always struggled with that in biblical times. They you know, they wanted to be like the nations around them and they did assimilate and they didn't, um, you know, put down the Canaanites and all 
the people they were commanded to. And then that, that very fact is what has kept them. It's almost a reverse, you know, God saying you will be a separate people and his hand is on them. In, so that, in that's a, don't go away, stay right there. So that's the perfect theme. When they're in their country, they want to be like all the other nations. We've seen it over and over again. She said it absolutely right. And then when they're kicked out of the country, they're in Babylon, they're in Egypt, they're uh, dispersed all over the world, then they're like, we need to be called out and separate and not assimilate. So that, that is a pattern and a theme you see all through Jewish history. So thank you. It's a lesson for us, she said, and I think I agree with her. Um, no other hands raised. Okay, we'll go on to the next one. So... <clears throat> He wrote this book, it's called Alt Neuland, which means Old New Land. And he proposed that they gather funds from around the world to do the same thing they did in Colonial Williamsburg in 1933. <laughs> Buy up the land secretly. Buy up the land secretly. So they get the money together and then they buy it all up. That's what, exactly what Rockefeller did with W.A.R. Goodwin in Williamsburg. They didn't tell anybody. They formed a foundation, and they secretly bought up all the property in Williamsburg because it was the Depression. We can get it for a song. And then the axe fell in Williamsburg. And it was, if your house was built after 1776, it got um, basically hauled up, put on a flatbed, and hauled out of town. In 1934, 84 buildings left Colonial Williamsburg. <laughs> so the same thing is true here. It's really interesting. They secretly got all this money together to buy land in Israel quietly, secretively, so that they could start building a nation from scratch. So <clears throat> the organization when eventually formed was called the Zionist Organization. So this is how Zionism gets started. But they're planning like it'd be like if you were going to start Virginia and the whole United States and everybody in England said, OK, let's uh, talk about hospitals. Let's talk about infrastructure, about roads. Let's make sure we do the bridges. This is the map of the country. Before we get there, let's have all this in place before we even come to Virginia. Uh, that way we're not living in little mud huts in Jamestown. OK, so that's the kind of planning we're talking about with this. It's just incredible. So Herzl saw the future as a model state society being uh, raising his ideas on the European model of the time, a modern enlightened society that would be neutral, peace-seeking, and of secular nature. All three of those ideas are obliterated. Like, that's what his ideal was, but none of those actually happened. His Zionist novel, Out Neuland, Old Newland in 1902, Herzl pictured the future Jewish state as a uh, socialist utopia. He envisioned a new society that would rise from the land of Israel in a cooperative basis, utilizing science and technology to develop the land, not God. Science, technology. That was his vision of the new Jew. We're going to divorce ourselves from the past and we're gonna move forward. He included detailed ideas about how he saw the future state's political structure, immigration, fundraising, domestic relations, social laws, and relations between religion and the state. In Out Neuland, the Jewish state was foreseen as a pluralist, advanced society, and a light to the nations. This book had a great impact on the Jews of the time and became the symbol of the Zionist vision of the land of Israel. The reason why it's important to understand Out Neuland is to understand how it got started, but how it all changed over time. So a whole generation came into this vision and said, you're right, we need to just leave Yahweh out of this and be scientific and technological. So a whole generation missed out on their Jewish religious roots and they were like mom dad why did you not tell us that there was our, our god you know that all this happened and so there was a resurgence in the 60s against this whole notion that that god was left out so this out Neuland really uh flip-flopped again um and it wasn't the way that he envisioned it this is his journalist card and this is when he was there for the degra degradation of uh Alfred Dry Dreyfus, um, and then in 1897 was, and this is really important to see because 
we're exactly 50 years from this event the nation of Israel was born. So it was an idea 50 years before, and it came into full fruition in 50 years. So, and he didn't live to see it. So that's the other interesting thing. Herzl's idea were met with enthusiasm by the Jewish masses in Eastern Europe, although Jewish leaders were less ardent. Herzl appealed to the wealthy Jew Jews, such as Baron Hirsch and Baron Rothschild to join the national Zionist movement, but in vain. He then appealed to the people and resulted in the convening of the first Zionist Congress in Basel, Switzerland on August, um, that should be 1931, um, and 1897. So tell me a little bit about Baron Hirsch and Baron Rothschild. Anybody know anything about these two guys? You can look it up on your phone. Yes. Thank you, Jason. The Hirsch's, but I know the Rothschilds were famous for how much wealth they had and how many banks and stuff they had in Europe and things like that. So they were like J.P. Morgan of Europe. You know, they had connections to almost all the wealth of Europe. I mean, it was just incredible what they did have, but it was surprising he wouldn't um, help them. So the other issue is this. They were so successful in all the nations, they're like, why do we need a homeland? You know, why do we need to go? So dislodging people when they're very wealthy and they have businesses and connections and power and influence, why would you want to leave? You know, that's why you're going to see um, World War I frees up the land. World War II frees up the, the people to come back to the land. World War III, which I think we're on the cusp of, is going to hopefully bring the king back. And to put it in perspective, who were the Axis powers in World War I? This should be a simple one for you guys. Since you're Christadelphia, I believe. Germany, that's an easy Austria-Hungary, and the main one was the Ottoman Empire. Huge. It had all the Middle East, all of Europe, sorry, all of uh, North Africa, and it was massive. So that was, those were the countries involved in World War I. World War II, who were the Axis powers? And Japan. In World War III, who's going to be the Axis powers? Russia, China, Iran, Turkey, Syria, Iraq, I, well, I recovered Iran, um, Lebanon, possibly Egypt, and Jordan. And, I mean, so, and maybe even Brazil. Look how much bigger it is than World War I and World War II look like specks compared to that. So um, it's important to see what, what, what will happen here. Um, the Congress was first the interterritorial inter gathering of Jews on a national and secular basis. Delegates adopted the Basel program, a program of Zionist movement, and declared Zionism is seeking the establishment of the homes for the Jewish people in Palestine secured under public law. At the Congress, the World Zionist Organization was established as a political arm of the Jewish people, and Herzl was elected the first president. Herzl convened six Zionist Congresses between 1897 and 1902. It was there that the tools of Zionist activism were forged, um, and the Jewish National Fund, the movement newspaper, die Welt. After the first Zionist Congress, the movement met yearly at an international Zionist Congress, and that was in Basel, Switzerland. In 1936, the center of Zionist movement was transferred to Jerusalem. Good thing, because all of Europe was going to be taken over by that time. So what's also interesting is that all this planning was done beforehand, and it fits with the biblical model because it says, can a nation be born in a day? Yeah, it was, because all this planning went into it beforehand and God said it and it, it did happen. So um, in 1897, uh, as a subsequent Zionist Congress, Herzl and delegates from various countries and societies created the institutions that would become the basic structure of the future state of Israel. They also strove to gain international recognition and support for the Jewish state. And we're going to get to the Balfour Declaration. The first Zionist Congress adopted the Basel program, which stated Zionism aims at establishing for the Jewish people a publicly and legally assured home in Palestine, which is basically what the letter said in the Balfour Declaration. Now, two things that I, I think are, are interesting about this 
is that Theodore Herzl didn't even live long enough to see this happen. This model became the nation of Israel, um, the government, as you were, because they bought the land. The whole idea of a kibbutz was to redo the, the land, to prepare the land, to support the people with their own agriculture. Um, so here's the twist of fate. Zionism came about to create a Jewish homeland. What it's been translated into is to say, and this is the UN and all of Israel's enemies, Zionism is racism. That's what they're preaching now. They're preaching now that Zionism is apartheid, okay? Both are totally, utterly lies, but it sticks because of envy and jealousy. So that's the mouthpiece that people are constantly espousing. Why could anybody truthfully say that Israel was an apartheid state? They can't. In their own Knesset, they have Arabs and Jews. Would that be allowed if they were an apartheid state? No. So I just want to show you what the real initial Zionism was. It was pragmatic, it was tactical, it was strategic, but it wasn't to displace other people. It was for to stop their persecution because they believed sovereignty in their own nation would stop the hate, but it didn't. Um, so Psalms 147.2 says, the Lord rebuilds Jerusalem, he gathers Israel's exiled people. So this is a picture of the Zionist Congress in 1898. The program goes on to deliberate the, the means to achieve this goal, to pronounce of the settlement of Jewish agriculturalists, artisans, tradesmen, and manufacturing in Palestine. The organization and uniting of all Jews by means of appropriate local and international institutions in accordance with the laws of the various countries. To strengthen and, um, and fostering of Jewish national settlements and national consciousness, that was really important. It was like, we need to establish a national headspace before we go there. We have to envision ourselves as a people, as a nation, before we get there. And I think that's just brilliant. Um, by 1947, 50 years after Basel's Congresses, the Zionist organization and national institutions established the various Congresses had transformed and grown into the national institutions of nascent um, Jewish state, paving the way for the establishment on May 15th, 1948. Now in 2017, we not only celebrate the 200 and, sorry, 120th anniversary of the first Zionist Congress, we also have the privilege to witness how Herzl's vision became a reality. Um, and Herzl said, if you will it, it is no dream. So he did will it, he didn't live to see it, but in 50 years after this, this happened. Significantly, right now, this is the first war since the Yom Kippur War in October 1973, and it happened again in October 2023. Um, there's been a lot of skirmishes in between, but this war is also on the 50th anniversary, just like this was. So can I get a reader for Ezekiel 11? Um, and this is about the regathering of, of Israel from verse 14 to 20. Go ahead. The word of the Lord came to me again, son of man, your own relatives, those who have the right to redeem you and the entire house of Israel, all of them are those that the residents of Jerusalem has said this to stay away from the Lord. This land has been given to us as a possession. Therefore say, this is what the Lord God says. So I sent them far away among the nations and scattered them among the countries. Yet for a little while, I have been a sanctuary for them in the countries where they have gone. Therefore say, this is what the Lord God says. I will give you from, I gather you from the peoples and assemble you from the countries where you have been scattered. And I will give you the land of Israel. When they arrive there, they will, be, they will remove all of its detestable things and practices from it. And I will give them one heart and put a new spirit within them. I will remove their heart of stone from their bodies and give them a heart of flesh so they may follow my statutes keep my ordinances and practice them. Then they will be my people and I will be their God. But as for those whose heart pursue their desire for detestable things and practices, I will bring their actions down on their own heads. This is the declaration of the Lord God. Okay. How much 
of this passage has come true and how much has not. Yeah, Jason? You still have the, uh, the Dome of the Rock that's there, right? So those detestable practices of worshiping. I, I, think, I think once that is gone, I think this is fulfilled. Yeah. I was listening to an interesting article yesterday, well, listening to a program on the Psalms 83 war, which we covered initially in the first class, um, and the nations that are all surrounding Israel. And it's really interesting. They tied it in with uh, Isaiah 17 about the destruction of Damascus. And they said, um, because of the war to the north and the south, they're going to have to strike um, Damascus. And when they do, that'll bring all these nations against them, which was an interesting thought. We don't know how it's going to play out, but it, it, it tied in very well. So what's interesting about this is that uh, all this migration of the Jews has never been easy. It's been very hard very difficult. They're always leaving everything behind, their businesses, their lands, and just taking suitcases and going to a new place with very little. Yes? I was just thinking about the fulfillment of that. And when you look at Herzl's initial thoughts, right, that was one of the detestable things that could potentially have been involved with setting up of this new nation. And so when that was destroyed over the years of people actually realizing, no, actually God is the true rock on which we want to stand, not secularism, then it actually resulted in that being put down. And so now Herzl's major plan and worldview of what Israel should be ends up falling apart since it's now being replaced with what God wants it to be. Yeah, his Herzl's vision stood for a while, but then it was definitely replaced. But this is God's plan for the re regathering of the nation of, of Israel and his people. And it isn't a secular one. Okay, I'm going to be a little vulnerable here. When I saw this photograph, I cried. It meant that much to me because you're seeing the Jews coming out of Egypt, crossing the Red Sea, and somebody put this together to all these people coming from all these nations into the land of Israel, being repatriated, being brought back. And I was like, what a great graphic designer <laughs> to put those two together. Can I get a reader for Isaiah 43 about the restoration of Israel? Go ahead, Jason. There's two Jasons, so one of you pick. <laughs> you got it? Brian, can you read the, the next one after this? I'm going to give it to you. 43, uh, sorry, it's chapter 43, verses 1 through 6, no, 7. But now thus says Yahweh who created you, Jacob, and he who formed you, Israel, don't be afraid, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned and flame will not scorch you. For I am Yahweh, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I have given Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Sheba as your place. Since you have been precious and honored in my sight, and I have loved you, therefore I will give people in your place and nations instead of your life. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your seed from the east and gather you from the west. I will tell the north, give them up, and tell the south, don't hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone called by my name. And everyone who is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, yes, whom I have made. So what I love about this is he says, you're precious in my sight and I'm going to bring you back. And he gives commands, which I love, to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west. And I'm like, this is phenomenal. And they all have to give them up and for these people to return back to their land. So um, hopefully I can get to the next one. At the end of that one. Um, let's see if we can get to it.
file open. Okay, let's see. I'm trying to get to the next class that I sent to you. Class two. Okay, thanks. Yep, that's it. Thanks. So you can see as we're coming up toward, towards this, um, we're getting up to World War I. There's so much about World War I that people don't know about and haven't seen. And the reason why it's important to study is because it reshaped the whole world, especially the Middle East. So um, I don't know how that happened. So just hit enable content and then click the big. OK. Perfect. Yeah, I mean, it's the NVN, it's the NVN the jealousy that has all led to this. Absolutely. That, that it's pure hatred. Do you mean it in some specific way? Oh, it's, it's always jealousy and envy. Always. It's, it's just, it is the engine that drives it. Yeah. So there's an underlying piece of it that, that Christians instituted and hampered themselves. When they, Excuse me. I tried to cover up. <laughs> Hello. Be, because for well, a long time, Christians class. didn't think that it was right to own mm -hmm. banks and to loan money, right? So, so they separated themselves from a lot of the, the wealth generation and creation, while Jews didn't, right? So that means that the love of money being the root of all kinds of evil um, stems into our jealousy because the Jews didn't have a lot of these regulations for for all those years, and Christians did. Now, now Christians don't care about you know having banks and 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 loaning money and taking interest. But for a long time, that was a principle of Christianity that 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 was unacceptable. But Jews didn't have that restriction. Yes, right. So as a result the Jews were able to accumulate the wealth and to loan money, which created the jealousy as well. So there, there are lots of underlying reasons that caused that. I, I did? I mean, I just didn't know what I was trying to, okay. All right, so let's get into this. Um, so I wanna just say, Part of, the, part of the thing that led to this, um, Tanner Hawkins kind of opened my eyes to, it's not going forward, I don't know why. Yep, okay. So the Ottomans took, it's, it's in the latter part of Daniel 11, the last half of it, when it talks about the king of the south and the king of the north. It's actually talking about the Marmaluks and the um, other tribe, which was Egyptian. And basically, they came up and pushed up against the, the kingdom, which was the Marmaleks to the north. And in that war of 1517 is when the whole um, Holy Land was absorbed into the Ottoman Empire. So it existed exactly for 400 years. And um, hopefully, this video will play. Sorry. I guess that's not going to work either. Is it showing up at all? No, I, I stopped it. Is it okay? All right. In our previous episode on Ottoman history, we covered their first war against the Safavids and the Battle of Chaldiran. Although the Ottomans were mainly concerned with European expansion in the first two centuries of their history, Chaldoran opened a new avenue for their conquests. The Ottomans were now on a collision course with the Mamluk Sultanate of Egypt, and the war between... The reason why I'm showing you this video back from 1517 is to say the Ottomans had had it for 400 years, from 1517 to 1917. And World War I destroyed the Ottoman Empire and freed up the land of Israel. So they captured it in 1517, which is Daniel chapter 11. 
and it was destroyed in World War I, and then we're going to talk about the Sykes-Picot Agreement. The two would change the situation in the Middle East for the next few centuries. But before we continue, allow us to thank our sponsor, Wix. Wix is everything you need to create a beautiful personalized site with solutions for every need. Be Sorry about that. It business or per Come on. Smell. Because I can't go past it. Oh well. I don't know why it's doing this. Okay. going to be over in a second. I'm sorry about that. So weird. Okay. I'm trying to advance it. I don't know why this isn't working. Anyways, I'm going to skip that. We don't need it. Um, so this is the Ottoman Empire and the Mamluk uh, Sultanate, um, which is basically the, the Burgundy you see to the south. And the Mamluks came against the Ottoman Empire, and that's when the land was conquered, January 15th, 1517, okay? Um, this was the shape of the Ottoman Empire at the time of World War I, and you could see they had encroached into large parts of Europe, uh, most of what they call Anatolia, which is Turkey, and the Middle East and North Africa. Um, and it gives you the dates, I probably can't see them very well, but they're on the left from 1300 all the way to the sort of the end of their conquest of their greatest extent. Um, so when World War, World War I comes along, the Ottoman Empire over Palestine, basically, this is a quick timeline, 1914. Um, they get into World War I and they side uh, with the Central Powers, Cyprus is annexed outright by Britain, and then in 1915, the Ottoman Empire initiates the forced deportation of Armenians. So talk to me about how Armenians feel about Turkey or the Turks today. They go, <laughs> they spit all over the place on their fingers because they, they, they hate them. They say this was the first genocide of the modern era. They literally, the Turks mowed down the Armenians and, and tried to destroy them all. So that, that happened in 1915. Then also in 1915 was the Gallipoli campaign. It was under the command of the Musafa Akemal and the uh, Ottoman army successfully repelled the British invasion of the Dardanelles in Turkey. I'm wrapping it up. I know it's the end. Okay, the reason why this is significant, who were, who were they, who was he up against? Who was, uh, Musafa Kamal fighting against. And the Gallipoli campaign, which is when they were trying to get into the Black Sea area, who was Musafa Kamal fighting against? The British. No. Winston Churchill. He was the Admiral of the Navy at the time. This was a disaster for Great Britain. His career was over as far as anybody could see because of that event. So we're gonna finish this up really fast. The siege of Kut was um, outside of Baghdad and then the Russian revolution occurs. They get out of World War I completely. So Russia's gone now. And by the armistice of uh, Mudros, um, the Ottoman Empire has shrunk to nothing. It is, is receded back into Anatolia or just Turkey. They have their own civil war in 1921 that completely changes their map. So we'll stop there and we'll pick up with World War I um, next time. I just wanna show you this photograph. This is World War I in Germany. You see any Jews in that photograph? They're all Jews. They're celebrating Hanukkah as German war warriors. I mean, it's just a laughable thing to think in 20 years, guys, you're not gonna be serving in the military. The military is gonna be chasing you around the country. It's just one of those very strange photographs um, of them celebrating Hanukkah in 1916 as German Jews. And they won all kinds of awards. So we'll, we'll talk about that next time. Thank you.